Hello there, you. I am Brother Bernard, as well you know. But where am I telling you a story from this week? Actually, I'm by some crumbly old cliffs halfway up a hill in Bath, which may or may not have once been called Badon Hill, Mount Badon, the site of King Arthur's greatest military triumph. It was somewhere around here. It was a mountain around here like he this is. And uh, I'm here, quite naturally, waiting for the mountain to open up so I can ask King Arthur himself exactly what went on back around the sort of fifth century because I get a feeling that somewhere around here he's got to be waiting, just waiting for a nice chat with a fellow like me. And in fact, I know a story very like this one uh, in fact, it's the, probably the second story that I ever retold when Tales of Britain first came to be. Except that this story is set a far bit north, and it's called The Wizard of Alderley Edge. And I'm going to do it for you now, just waiting for Arthur to turn up, or at least Merlin. But anyway, it's impossible to say exactly when all of this happened. But on the first really crisp day of autumn, one year... Far more than 12 years ago, but fewer than a thousand, a farmer which we, who know we, blah, blah, a farmer who we know only as farmer, is that kind of man, the farmer called farmer, set off across the sandstone crags of Alderley Edge in the county of Cheshire, on his way from his small holding in Mobberley to the market in the town of Macclesfield. With him, this farmer had the most dashing milk-white stallion bequeathed to him by a careless relative, which he hoped would fetch him a pretty penny, if not a gorgeous guinea, seeing as his latest crop of marrows was way too tiny to make him very rich that harvest tide. This farmer was not exactly the shiniest pebble on the beach, so to speak, but he knew a twinkly-eyed old gentleman with flowing green robes and a long white beard when he saw one, and that was exactly what he saw as he turned a corner and came upon the Thieves' Hole, a little dingly dell with its own tinkling well, which you can still go to to this day. The well tinkled as the old man twinkled. <coughs> ah, ha, 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 ha! beamed the beardy man. Farmer at last, isn't it? The farmer eyed the strange man askance. That's for me to know and for you to have a pretty good idea about too, chimed back the beardy man. But uh, um, 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 what year is it? He continued. The farmer told him with a snort. What he actually said, of course, we do not know, but he told him what year it was. Farmer had never been called clever, but at least he knew what year it was at any given time, and the month, although he often had a bit of a trouble with the days of the week. Well, no matter, no matter, sniffed the strange stranger. I thought you may have come along a year or two earlier, but hey-ho. Ah, and speaking of hay, you know, I'd really love to buy that fine snow-white steed from you, if I may. Oh, ah, ha-ha. <laughs> And what would you be offering me in return, Beardy? grinned Farmer. You can see she's a real smasher. Ah, oh, so she smashes too. Okay then. Well, I think I could run to a reasonable price. Ah, save your breath, old man, returned Farmer. Whatever you can offer, I could double at Macclesfield Market. They'd pay top whack for a white stallion like this one. Is it a stallion or is it a mare? We got a bit confused there. It's the gender it wants to be. That's lovely. That's fine. Lovely jam. I don't mind. <laughs> anyway, well, if so you say, then on you go on your way, said the old beardy man. I'll stop holding you up and let you continue on to the market at Macclesfield then. But take my promise, farmer. No man will buy that horse from you today. Well, cheers for that, mate, barked farmer through gritted teeth and set off down the sandy path to Macclesfield. The Macclesfield market dealers came out in force to admire Farmer's white stallion stroke mare that afternoon. They measured the horse and they brushed her and looked her in the mouth and found that she was the finest specimen they had ever had at market. But, uh, well, uh, 
Oh, I don't know. One particularly impressed coachman scratched his chin just as Farmer was moved to start the pleasant job of haggling, quoting prices and planning a big mutton steak for his supper. But um, what? He moaned. People have been saying that to him all day long. Oh, no, Farmer, replied the coachman. Something ain't quite... Uh... <laughs> and the coachman just kind of disappeared. He just walked off in a different... He took on a glassy look and wandered off into the hubbub of the market, leaving the farmer on his own. They're all mad or drunk, roared farmer. Come on, Aussie, we'll try the Oslo's in Wilmslaw instead. So off farmer trekked once again. It was with a groan that farmer spied the beardy, twinkly old man, still perched on a sandstone rock on Alderley Edge as he returned, twinkling as ever by his well, and patiently awaiting him. How did you get on then, friend? chortled the strange man. I reckon you know well enough, Airy Chin, shot back farmer as he dismounted. Go on then, clever clogs. What are you offering for this steed of mine? Mind, it's the best thing on four legs you're going to find in Cheshire, if not all of Britain. I'm sure you're entirely right, replied the beardy man, with an admiring pat of the by now visibly blushing horse's nose. This ho horsey, this horsey you see, is going to fit the bill perfectly. Follow me, but first... Wash your face in this well here. You're trying to say I've got a dirty face, Farmer bridled. Just do it, please, Farmer. I may have centuries to spare, but there's no time like the present. Once Farmer had taken a handful of water and rubbed his grimy fizzog, the wizard gave the well a kick, and suddenly it wasn't there. Never mind that, chirped the beardy man. I've returned it to its home at Castle Rock. Now, chop, chop, after me, Farmer. And so the man with the flowing robes and flowing beard held aloft his mighty knobbly old stick, which he'd been carrying all this time, and it suddenly glowed an eerie green glow in the twilight and f led Farmer past seven firs and the Golden Stone and Stormy Point, all places you can go to this day, and finally Saddle Bowl. Eventually, the three of them reached a mighty rock face with a crack Right down the middle. <clears throat> Hang on. There's my stick for you. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Would you be so kind as to put your fingers in your ears? The beardy old man asked Farmer. Daft old loon, mad or drunk, said the farmer, but he did as he was told with a grunt. Only then... With much goggling did Farmer see the crack in that old wall suddenly glow with the same eerie green light as the man's stick. Shudderingly, but undeniably, the hill seemed to creak open like an old wardrobe covered in thick cobwebs. Without another word, a whistle, or even a gasp, Farmer followed the old beardy man inside the hill. Just within was a mighty set of iron gates, which the wizard, because, I mean, let's face it, you know, this man, the green flowing robes, the big old beard, is obviously a wizard. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to work out what that was. He carefully pushed open the gates and invited the gobsmacked farmer to take a look around. Over on one side of the chasm inside, standing silently asleep, were six white horses, bridled and ready for battle. Shining in armour opposite these horses and equally deep in sleep were seven mighty warriors. And they dozed there, their faces hidden behind dazzling visors, but their weapons sharp and ready. Farmer's first thought that it was that it was going to be an ambush. Be calmed, the beardy wizard said. Leave this fine horse here with me and you can take with you all the jewels you can fit in your pockets as fit and fair payment. A mound, an absolute mound of gold and precious stones formed a throne in the centre of the cave, and with a shriek of delight, Farmer the Farmer fell to, stuffing opals and rubies and emeralds of every kind into every fold of his jerkin, even filling the brim of his daft old battered hat with handfuls of sapphires and the like. Soon he was, looked like he was 30 stone and it was nothing but jewels all around him. 
Yes, that's probably enough now, I think. <laughs> Laughed the beardy wizard. You should be sent on your way, farmer. I would demand that you speak not a word about this to anybody, but let's be honest, farmer the farmer, no one's ever going to think you're anything but mad or drunk if you do say anything about this. So really say what you like, old friend, but just don't expect to see any of us ever again. Not until the reign of George, son of George, son of George, son of George, will anybody see me or my dazzling Underhill army ever again. George, son of George, asked the puzzled mortal, trying to find a cranny of his clothes where he could fit in another handful of diamonds. Yes, I'm sure it was George, ruminated the wizard with a frown. Or maybe it was Ralph, son of Ralph, come to think of it. Wayne, son of Wayne, something like that. Or Terry. Anyway, it's not this century, certainly. It's, it's a century some other time. Goodbye for all time, farmer the farmer, and thank ye kindly. And with a thunk... Farmer suddenly found himself weighed down with jewels on the edgiest part of Alderley Edge, out in the open and completely alone. That, anyway, is the story as told by most, but there are some who say that the pig-headed farmer just couldn't leave well alone. He had all those riches, but he still wasn't happy. He swore to the folk around Alderley Edge that a fortune beyond imagining lay hidden inside that cracked part of the hill. Somewhere in there, that he had seen the wizard's well from Castle Rock just magically appear in the thieves' hole, he said, and that there was a strange old man with flowing green robes and a big gold beard and a, a big green stick. He kept going on and on about this green stick. And there, there was an army of seven warriors and, and so on and so on and so on. And uh, actually, that was as far as Farmer ever got before people just stopped listening to the mad old thing. Farmer scoured the whole of Alderley Edge and was sure he had found the very cracked rock that he had walked into. And he spent the rest of his riches and the whole rest of his life by trying to prise open those gates that he never found again. He uh, got a big team of strong oxen to pull at that part of the hill until it cracked open, but the poor moo cows were utterly exhausted before the stone had even shifted an inch. Eventually, Farmer the Farmer spent his very last penny on a barrel of gunpowder and took it into the woods to find the wizard's cave, and he was never seen again. There was one little girl called Ellen who did say many, many years later in the times of your granddad's granddad's granddad, little Ellen did once say that she heard the most alarming bang coming from somewhere near Saddle Bowl Hill. Ah, that'll be old farmer, returned her mother. But don't mind him. Since he became a rich man, he acts as if he's either mad or drunk. Come on, Ellen. And Ellen and her mother went on their way happy with what they had. The end. That's the end of the story, and, and still, Mount Baden is refusing to open up and give me an exclusive interview with King Arthur. But, uh, I'll give it another five minutes.